I just began a vacation. I was two days into it and uh, Operation Kronos took place. Uh, they took down Lockbit's infrastructure and they uh, began this sort of psychological operation that was uh, lasted for about a week where they released different pieces of information and sort of toyed with the threat actors. Uh, and, and because of that, that takedown, I had to uh, cancel my vacation and come back uh, to work. Welcome to Needle Stack. I'm your host, Jeff Phillips. And I'm Shannon Reagan. Today, we're going to be discussing the ins and outs of ransomware and the groups behind it with John DiMaggio. Yeah, this is going to be a really fun conversation. John is the chief security strategist at Analyst One. Analyst One's a threat intelligence uh, provider and platform. He's also, though, the uh, author of Ransomware Diaries. It's a blog series. It's uh, actually reads like a mystery novel. So I definitely <laughs> suggest you you check it out. John, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, can you start us off by telling us a little bit about what Ransomware Diaries is and how you got started with it? Yeah. So uh, the Ransomware Diaries is it's, it's a series. Uh, essentially, uh, I've been doing research and writing for years and I really wanted to have a way to sort of uh, gel the content together and, and have uh, a story that sort of threads and intertwined uh, from one piece to the next. Uh, and, you know, over the years of research, I, I've really found that a lot of the ransomware attackers that, uh, that I interact with are, are are connected and it's a much smaller world than most people realize. So I thought this might be a good opportunity to sort of highlight that um, and, and sort of provide research uh, as well as tell a really good story. Um, I've spent a lot of my career, I worked for the government uh, for years doing intelligence reports and you know I've written uh, from that aspect as well as publicly when I came to uh, Symantec, when I left the government where I was doing a lot of nation state work um, and that was all straight CTI based type of work, uh, cyber threat intelligence type of work. And um, so, so when I came to Analyst One, I had a lot, a lot more creative freedom uh, <laughs> and I really wanted to experience and on that. So, so that's sort of what the ransomware diary was, is, or it is, is my creative outlet uh, to still provide uh, intelligence uh, and, and try to sort of fight the fight with ransomware, if you will, and to shed light on stories that otherwise wouldn't be known uh, by adding the human element on top of that CTI piece and, and to really uh, give a in-depth view of what we're, we're facing when, uh, you know, we're chasing these guys and the zeros and ones. I wanted people to understand that there's there's more to it than that. Um, and that's that's what the Ransomware Diaries is. And uh, I continue to write it. There's been four volumes so far. Uh, they're each about 60 or 70 pages. Uh, and they take, you know, anywhere from three to six months for me to, uh, to put together. Well, they are super interesting and they do read. The, the human element comes through. That's been... Um what's been so different to me in from a ransomware perspective uh is is hearing about these individuals which means um you talk about that you get to communicate with some of them but you, you, for our cti um researchers out there you talk about having to build up credibility um i believe you're lurking in places and in forums uh dark and surface web um and so you talk about building up credibility. Could you could you tell a little tell me a little bit about that? Was it difficult? Um, how are you doing that? Are you using different? You know, do you have personas? So how how are you going about hanging out in these in these ransomware places? Yeah. So there, there's very uh, there's two varying ways that that I go about that. But the first way is the way that ninety nine percent of the rest of researchers in this space would do it, which is developing fake personas. Now, developing fake personas uh, is not something where you just go create an account and use it. Uh, it, it, it requires planning. It requires developing a, a backstory for this character. It's, it's almost like developing a character in a book. Uh, you have Good to, to be a writer. Uh, it, it, 
Yeah, yeah. You, you, you literally, you need, you need to create this person if you want them to be believable. And then once you've sort of created this and, and detailed what you want this person to be, you need to go give them an online presence. And so I'll go and register accounts, even ones you're not going to use, just so, so that if it's a real person, they're going to have these things. So you create other accounts, uh, social media accounts. Uh, you try to get on uh, some of the, the lower hanging fruit farms, meaning some of the ones that necessarily don't require uh, a validation for from, from another uh, hacker or, or things of that nature, just to, to, to get your, your name out there. And then you have to start actually talking to people and making posts and commenting on things. And of course, when you're developing that, you want it to be within the topic of what you're going to eventually research, but you don't want it to be where you're going to stand out and people are going to know you. So there's just a lot of development that goes into it over time. Once you've created a nice footprint uh, and it's, it has this character, if you will, appears to be believable. There's people you've interacted with. There's people that you've made, um, you know, friends, if you will, with it that will will talk to, about you and, and say, yeah, I've had conversations with that person. Then you can start thinking about using it to get closer to wherever your target is. Um, and, and that requires other work too, you know, using uh, different uh, open source techniques uh, and OSIN techniques in order to uh, uh, fingerprint your, your target and identify where they live, the accounts that they use, who they talk to, what those roles are. You wanna do all of that before you ever engage with someone. And uh, cause, cause you don't wanna end up not having an answer for a question or looking right. like, or at least a question that you should be able to answer or looking like, you know, you just started doing this yesterday. Uh, so it takes a lot of work and a lot of time and you also, while you're developing one to use actively, you have to have uh, other accounts. Um, so all of accounts that are just what I call my, my newsreader accounts where it's, it's, a, it's almost like the opposite of being an initial access broker. Initial access brokers gain access to networks and then sell it to other criminals to uh, compromise. Uh, what I do is I'll gain access to criminal forums and then I will just stay there and won't do anything with that account and just use it to sort of monitor. That's why I call it my, my, my news account. And then there's oh, other okay. accounts that, where I actually touch things, talk to people um, and engage. But while you're doing this, you have to have a third account that's what that's farther down the development road than your newsreader account because you need a backup account for whatever for whatever reason eventually your accounts get burned and you don't want to start this whole process over and be down for you know three to six months so it's an evolving uh cycle where you have to constantly feed into it the more you feed into it the better output you're going to get from it wow Sounds like a Dickens novel. It's very complex. <laughs> it is complex. There's an art to it for sure. Um, and then language barriers are a whole nother topic. I mean, there, 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 there's a lot of every uh, every engagement and every piece of research I do uh, requires uh, different things. And a lot of times with especially ransomware, they're Russian speaking. Um, I've I just did did an engagement. Um, you know, over the past six months, a lot with, with Ransom VC, which is who the Ransom Diaries for was about. And they were uh, very fluent in English. And so were sort of the, their top affiliates. So that required a different, uh, a different approach, but it also made the communication much easier and the conversations would be much longer. At the same time, those people are going to get to know you much more. Uh, and that brings to the second uh, piece of what you asked me. Um, I told you there were two different approaches. I told you the approach that 99% of of CTI researchers and analysts or human, human intelligence analysts would do, and that's creating fake personas. I'm in a unique position because of sort of the popularity of the ransomware diaries that has, uh, that's been gained by hackers in addition to uh, CTI researchers. Um, that's allowed me to use my, my real life identity and persona to also talk and, and create these relationships. And, and I get different output when I do that. Um, but, you know, after my name was out there and my face was on the first ransomware diaries and, uh, you know, Lockbit started using my face as their avatar on one of the, on one of the dark web forums, you know, there was no point in, I might as well benefit from it then. I mean, there's, I'm not hiding at that point. They know who you are. Clearly, they're sending you a message. They know who you are. So I might as well go with it and use it to benefit my research. And that's what I did. But, but most people aren't going to do that and they shouldn't do that because it's, uh, it's, it, it's not, not for a weak stomach. That's for sure. That seems stressful for sure. Well, you mentioned the L word. Uh, should we talk Lockbit? Why not? Have you talked Lockbit enough? 
<laughs> you have been on the uh, the press junket uh, yes. for your investigation into this this group, your interaction with Bastard Lord, uh, and all of the great information that you've written about it and that you've shared. Yeah, I've, I've been on the on the Lockbit tour uh, lately. Um, you know that 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 really began. Uh, I was actually I just began a vacation. I was two days into it and. Uh, Operation Chronos took place. Uh, they took down Lockbit's infrastructure and they uh, began this sort of psychological operation that was uh, lasted for about a week where they released different pieces of information and sort of toyed with the threat actors. Uh, and, and because of that, that takedown, I had to uh, cancel my vacation and come back uh, to work. And um, so since then, yeah, I've been talking to law enforcement agencies, government agencies, lots of uh, media organizations. You know, a lot of people want to talk, talk about the topic right now. And because I just happened to to be in a place where I'm very close to um, the people behind Lockbit and have been uh, doing this, the CTI research on Lockbit now for, for a year and a half, two years. Um, you know, I, I've just been sort of a subject matter expert. So yes, I, I've been talking about it a lot, but yeah, you know, you go with, with, with what the flow with what's happening in the world right now. So I thought I was actually going to be working on my next project would not be Lockbit and uh, I, the way things are going, I have a feeling I, I won't be able to get away uh, just quite yet, but uh, we'll see. But yeah, lock, Lockbit is definitely a hot topic right now. Could you, could you talk a bit about your investigation? Like it, you know, it's, it's sprawling, like the CTI element, mm. you know, there's an, an open source investigation, um, an OSINT element to it as well. But you're also, you're engaging directly with the threat actors. Um, you're also reaching out to victims as well, like the human aspect of it as, as well. Have you, can you talk about how you tied those threads together? Yeah. So, um, you know, the CTI aspect, you know, I, I think most people are going to understand what that is. That's sort of looking at the zeros and ones, looking at the indicators of compromise, uh, understanding the attack chain of each step of, of what the attacker does in order to complete that that overall objective of uh, extorting and ransoming victims. Uh, but there's another aspect to it. And it's something I, I before I changed, meaning I wrote most of my career, I, I just did the CTI part. And before I really changed uh, my tactics, you know, the, it was one day I just kind of thought about it and I was like, ransomware victims have to talk to their attacker, attacker 100% of the time, uh, or as you say, communicate, not necessarily okay. talk, but they have to communicate with their attacker 100% of the time. So it, 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 it made me you know, really think about it. That is something where we know very little information about these people, yet we're having to, to deal with them and to talk to them. And they're humans, so they're going to have things that influence what they do. They're going to have aspects of who they are and their character and their personality traits that if you understand that better, uh, you can use that to your advantage when you're doing these negotiations. So um, that was kind of what got me uh, on the thread of, hey, we need to start looking at the humans behind it. Um, but it's not just that, because there has been for years more on the government side, there's been, you know, the, this human intelligence aspect where people have an expertise in that. And then you've had more of the CTI piece, but no one, at least at a, at a public level, is really putting that together. And so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to better understand the people who are conducting the attacks. I wanted to better understand how it's affecting the victims behind it, how they're handling these things when it's taking place. And I, I've, you know, I obviously already understood the CTI piece, but I wanted to put that all together. And at the same time, I wanted to tell a really interesting story because I write 60, 70 page, uh, you know, pieces of research for each one of these volumes. If it is not sort of, you know, quote unquote, fun and exciting, people wouldn't read it. So my goal in doing this is to share information and to make it read, you know, like a Tom Clancy novel. Uh, but but I don't want it to be <laughs> deviate too far away to where it's it's still not, you know, hitting the mark of being solid analytical research. And, uh, you know, one of the things I, I build myself on is how to conduct attribution. And, you know, I wrote a whole book on how to do practical CTI type of work. So I have a thorough understanding of that, but I don't focus on, on that part as much, but I always want to show my findings, provide the evidence, kind of like my, my, my math teacher used to tell me, show your work. So right. if a human person tells me something, I'm going to include that. But if I'm going to value that as high confidence, and I need to have technical data to support that. And if I don't, I'm still going to share it, but I'm going to assess it at a lower confidence rating. And I think it's important that you put all this together so that your reader, one, gets the information, gets the technical piece, gets the human piece, 
likes it because it's a good story. Uh, but more <laughs> importantly, they have a feel for how how valuable this or invaluable this information is so they can use it and make judgments moving forward as their own attribution as they work through attacks that are affecting their organization. Well, I do think <clears throat> the, the diaries, um, they do a great mix of, of pulling that all together. Um, you know, someone that's not as technical, I can, you know, still get the gist of the humans behind it, but I can see where you're, you're also helping the, the threat intel analysts. But I do want to go in because to some of that human element, there's, um, you've talked personally with a number of the members of, of Lockbit, of this group, um, and hearing their backgrounds and personalities is super interesting. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about one of them in particular? Um, Bastard Lord is a um, super interesting character. I know he's real, but great name. Um, and the group dynamics, uh, you know, Tell us a little about him and then the overall group dynamics within this ransomware gang. Yeah, so Master Lord uh, really surprised me. He was uh, much different than what I sort of perceived before, before I went into this to talk to him. Um, but I've, I've spoken with him a lot over uh, over the past year. And, you know, if, if, he, if I didn't know he was a criminal, uh, my answer would be, I, I like the guy. You know, I think he's, he's a good guy. He is a likable person. Um, I, he's out of everyone I've talked to, he's probably one of the, that there's a short list of ones that I've actually have established relationships with that I actually care about what happens to now for everybody that's, that's going to beat me up for saying that that doesn't mean I don't think that you should be held accountable for your crimes. It just means there's a difference between someone who is reckless or mentally ill, or, you know, wants to harm up people physically, you know, that are just really bad people at the core versus people who have you know, taken the wrong path in life, and now they're so far in that that's all they know. And that would be more bastard lord. Um, he, I think, if in a different scenario, he would have had a much different life. Uh, but that doesn't matter because that's not the scenario he had. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've, I learned how to how to understand people and not judge them. And I try to, uh, and it is something you have to learn because you don't even know that you have preconceived, um, you know, things in your head sometimes before you talk to somebody. But what I really learned about, about that. Master Lord was, you know, he uh, he really isn't di that different than a lot of CTI analysts uh, outside of the aspect that he he commits really bad crimes, um, you know. So so when I talk to him, you know, I I, I never condone what he does. Um, he and, and I'm direct and in, with my intent when I when I begin these engagements with people, I tell them I don't lie to them, especially when it's, when it's being done as myself. I tell them, you know, I'm very straightforward. I say I'm researching you. I'm not going to to make you look good in my writing. I'm going to be professional and uh, I'll always be you know pr professional when I talk to you. But the end result is is going to be me trying to find information that's going to help take you down. Um, and if they still want to talk to me, then we continue. But uh, you know, I, I don't want to lie to them. Uh, especially, again, it's different with a fake persona. But if I'm doing this as myself, I feel like I need to be straightforward. And if they still want to sure. talk to me, great. And if they don't, they don't. But Bastard Lord was there was something more um, appealing about his personality because he was able to to, to show empathy. Um, you know, there was a time where uh, he found some some other. I'm not gonna get too far into details with this, but some of the ransomware guys he knew were going to, you know, um, attack a hospital. He convinced them not to, and he provided me with the information so that I could, I could contact them to get them to fix the vulnerability. So that's my point. He is different than most of the ransomware actors that are out there. Um, that, and we, we just, we would talk about things that are farther outside of the realm than just what our job is. You know, we'd actually, uh, you know, t talk about music that we like, different types of sports that we watch and like, you know, life stories, those type of things. So it's a unique relationship, but I think it really has gotten me not to be able to not only just understand him, but it's really helped me to understand, uh, how to approach other threat actors. Not all of them are fall, most of them don't fall in, in sort of the, uh, the cast that, that, that Bastard what does that I just, that I just explained, but most of them are, are, are a little bit different and, and some of them are very dangerous and threatening and do bad things and want to harm people, just to harm people. And, uh, and, and so you have to, understand those people so that you can then tailor how you're going to interact with them in order to keep yourself safe. Well, speaking of the uh, maybe the not so nice or the not so complex, um, how do you how do you deal with the balance of like 
you know, contacting them, you know, engaging in conversations with people that might be doing terrible things or saying terrible things while they do it. Yeah, uh, that's it's not easy. And I've been I am not a I am I am a trained um CTI analyst. I'm a trained intelligence analyst. Uh, I am not a trained human analyst. I had to, I've just had to learn on my own and kind of, kind of see what happens type of thing, which is not a great, great way to approach this. But, um, you know, I wanted to, to explore this and, and that was the only way to do it. Um, so, so that balance is difficult because here's the difference. As a CTI analyst, you know, the only thing that's dictating when I have to work is my employer. As what I do now, what there's a human aspect to it, a human intelligence aspect to it, uh, what dictates it is, is real world people and events. So, um, when I'm trying to build a relationship just because, you know, I'm on vacation or just because it's a Saturday, that doesn't mean I can just say, Hey, I'm off hours. I can't talk. I could do that, but I'm not going to develop a relationship with this person because if I tell you this is only a working relationship, it's going to, it's going to go, uh, it's not going to go anywhere near as far as if I build a relationship where you get to know me and I get to know you personally. Um, and, and that takes a lot of time and effort. Now, on top of that, you know, I've talked to some, some pretty scary people you know, over the years now. And, you know, with, with that, um, you know, you also can't just blow people off if, if they're a crazy psychopath criminal that wants to be the world's you know, most evil villain, which some of these guys have mental illnesses and that is how they perceive themselves, you know, so it's a very delicate balance. There's always a, a risk and a threat. Um, it's something that doesn't just affect uh, the person doing it, but you also have to consider how that's going to affect, you know, your family, friends, the people around you. Um, and, and then you have to kind of table your whole life to it. Just as an example, um, you know, doing this, you can't have social media for your personal life and yeah. you can't have people that are meaningful to you connect to them. Um, you know, you, you have to constantly be worried, you know, or not, I don't know if word's the right word, but you have to be aware of everything around you and, and know that. There are crazy people that could do crazy things, you know, have a rock or a brick thrown through your window, have you swatted, uh, worst case scenario, use violence as a service against you, you know, all of those things. It's a very delicate balance and you have to go into that again. I, I keep repeating this, but with intense and a well thought out approach before you ever engage with, with these guys and understand that it could go south anytime and you got to know when to get out. And let, let, can we go into that just a, a little deeper? We, t we, you know, the OPSEC side of this, um, because you, and you are, well, you're already using your, your, your real name, but <clears throat> can we talk about when you're on the dark web for general CTI analysts? How do you investigate these groups? How do you protect yourselves during those investigations? Yeah. So true. So for years, um, you know, uh, what I would actually have to do is, um, create, uh, virtual machines and have, uh, well, I, st I still have a separate network for when I do my research, but have separate networks, um, uh, you know, constantly uh, make sure you have separately uh, physical devices that are separated from personal work. And then, you know, what I call research, you know, we're actually reaching out and doing this stuff. Uh, and, and it's very cumbersome, especially when you're when you're dealing with, uh, you know, virtual machines and having multiple running at once and all these different resources, it can be, it can be difficult. So, um, one of the tools, you know, that I use is, is authenticate silo and, and that, that is actually a tool. I, I'm not one that, that ever champions a, a vendor, uh, but it's made my job so much easier. And it's one of the very few resources where I actually got more than what I was promised, uh, you know, at the point of the sale. Um, so, so what, what that does, what Silo does and enables me to do is, um, I, I can, I basically, I don't, I still have virtual machines that I use for specific mm -hmm. things, but for 90% of what I do now, um, I'm able to use Silo. Silo, the best way I could describe it is there's a data server somewhere that's that when I send my, my queries to, to go, whether it's to the dark web or go to whatever site I want to research, I can pick where I'm coming from anywhere in the world and it'll run sort of in that in that data center, but it almost mirrors it back to my screen. Well, the reason that that's so important is because if I'm visiting a Russian forum and let's, if I don't speak Russian and I have to, to go in there speaking with English and then translate everything, all of that is things that can be detected in their logs as you're doing it. This literally, it even as a translation service that's done after the fact, you, I don't actually see that. It, it, it operates the same as it would if I was using like a tra traditional translator, but it doesn't 
leave any traces on their logs or their systems. I can pop out, visit a, a Russian dark web forum. Uh, it'll appear as though I, well, from like, again, from a data uh, entry logging aspect that I actually am speaking the language based off of those um, settings on my browser and everything else. So uh, those are things that I have to think about and, and, and do manually when I use um, virtual machines. So I've even used it on my, I, I don't do this often, but I've been in a situation where I've even had to use it on my phone um, before. So, so I think you're right because you're, you're 24 by seven in this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. But anywhere that I have a web browser, I, I can be on, I, I use a lot of different uh, systems and operating systems with, with different tools for different things, but anything as a web browser, I can access uh, silo through. And, and most importantly, at least in my opinion, compared to most of the tools that I've had to buy, it's 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 much uh, more cost effective than, than the other tools I buy. And I use it more than any of them. So, I mean, there's lots of tools that I use, but that's probably the tool that surprised me the most uh, over over the years here we love to hear that thank you <laughs> we do we do john and i our listeners know we don't often go down the path of, of touting the product here but i um yeah no one's asked me to do this i just am a cheerleader because i have been surprised so infrequently by by vendor tools and resources and it is, makes my life easier and safer which is the only reason i mean even in my writing you'll never very rarely do you ever see me even mention analyst one or any any of the software they make um and that's not because i don't use it or like it but this was so unique and so helpful for my my work that uh, you know, I, I don't care if I sound like a like a, a commercial for it because people need to know about it, and people it's going to make analyst jobs uh, just just that much easier to do. And even if I was a private researcher and I didn't work for a company, it's something that I, I could afford on my own if I wanted to. So I, I, I think it's something that, that people need to understand because it's going to keep them safer when they're doing this type of work. And and I really uh, re really appreciate the product. Well, thank you, and. Look, we appreciate, the, again, to our listeners, you check out, it's John DiMaggio, check out Ransomware Diaries, um, follow him uh, and the company. It is super, super interesting. Uh, all the elements from technical to the human side of ransomware, um, it, they're great reads. Uh, so we hope you continue with that work. So, th And thank you for joining us today. It's very much appreciated uh, that you spent this much time with us course. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. We'll have all of John's uh, uh, information, social media, etc. in the show notes. Um, thank you all for, again, spending time with us on, on Needlestack. You can view transcripts, uh, other episode info on our website, authenticate.com slash Needlestack. That's authentic with the number eight dot com slash needle stack and be sure to let us know your thoughts on x formerly twitter or blue sky we're there on blue sky at needle stack pod and to like and subscribe wherever you're listening today we'll see you next time on needle stack